Welcome to the Agent of Wealth podcast with Mark Boudis from Boudis Financial. In this podcast, Mark helps guide you towards financial freedom, ensure you never run out of money, and create a balance in life that prioritizes what is most important to you. Join us for this journey as Mark draws from years of expertise and guest experts to solve the multiple wealth building challenges involved in your financial life. Welcome back to the Agent of Wealth. This is your host, Mark Boudis. On today's show, I brought on a special guest, Micah Frame, to talk about cryptocurrency taxation. Micah is a crypto and NFT obsessed CPA and the best selling author of Decrypting Crypto Taxes and the Little Big Small Business Book. Micah, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. So I'm excited to talk about cryptocurrency and taxes. I think it's an area where there's a lot of confusion. Um, but before we even get into some of those details, how'd you get involved in it? And I know it was probably through investing, but specifically on the tax side, did you come across a lot of people that needed help with it? Got involved initially just because I always say, like everyone else, in 2017, during the the ICO craze, I bought a couple grand worth of crypto. And given that I was buying at what was the peak, the $3,000 I put in turned into $1,000 very quickly. And I just kind of forgot about it for a few years. And then come 2020, I checked the balance and it had recovered to be worth like six or nine grand. And at the same time, I had a client who was involved in a crypto project that told me about it. And it was the first time that I understood the use case and the utility of a specific crypto project because I'm not a tech guy. So I knew that smart people said blockchain technology is a big deal. This is going to be the future, all these use cases for it. I'm like, okay, blockchain itself, that's a big deal, but why is Bitcoin or Litecoin or Ethereum? I I didn't understand at that point why each individual project or token would have any value. So this was the first time that I understood why a specific project would have value. Started investing in that, and then from there just cascaded to where I started looking more and more in the space as an investor and just trying to understand how it worked and very quickly needed to do tax planning for myself and very quickly realized that there was next to no guidance out there. So largely for my, just for my own investing, but then a lot of our clients are online based businesses. So they're a little more tech savvy anyways. So they are more naturally inclined to want to invest in crypto. So we are getting more and more of our clients also saying, Hey, I've, I'm involved in XYZ project. What do we do? Yeah, so, I mean, let's kind of get to it. How is crypto trades taxed? Yeah, so, so crypto trades, um, those, w- what will foul people up, and this is sort of like, like you said, foundational starting at the beginning, but what will foul people up is they will, the big myth in crypto circles is that none of the crypto income that you have is taxable until you cash it out for a fiat currency like U.S. dollars. So they'll mm-hmm. think that if you're trading... Bitcoin for Ethereum, for Solana, for whatever other tokens, when you're making all of these trades, people will think that those aren't taxable events until you actually swap it out for U.S. dollars. Unfortunately, that's just not the case at all. The IRS has, hasn't issued much guidance on crypto taxation, but one of the things they very explicitly notice is that these coin-for-coin coin or token-for-token token trades, those are each taxable events. So it can be looked at as like each token, essentially, if I'm selling one, buying another, that's basically the equivalent of selling Apple stock and buying Google stock in terms of it's a taxable event and there may be a gain, there may be a loss associated with it. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people don't realize that, so they won't report any of their activity at all. The other thing that will happen is given how insanely volatile the crypto market is you can have it to where people are doing all of these individual transactions and are making a bunch of money so they've got taxable gains that got built up but then the next year or later in the year you have it to where it crashes down so they can lose all of that value but still have a huge tax bill it's like the same concept as like an unrealized versus realized gain and the volatility is just on steroids in in the crypto world yeah, it, it's the exact same thing. It's just, to your example of Apple and Google stock, you're not having one one week 
your Apple stock is down 50%. So it's, it's the same as a traditional security would be taxed. It's just that people are do, doing it in a much riskier environment. And given that, if you're doing planning around it, you're completely fine. If you're cashing out whenever you have one of these games, you're good. Most people don't do that. And one of the big things we're running into now, or extended returns finished up a few weeks ago, but we had people coming to us for the 2021 tax year and they would have six, seven figure gains in their crypto trading or income from other crypto projects, but they didn't cash out at all. And then the value of the project or the token they were involved in went down 50 to 99%, depending on how risky the asset was. So you have people who had seven figure incomes just from crypto which generates six figure tax bills but their portfolio is not even worth that much anymore yeah and is it the same like any other asset in the sense of a a long-term versus short-term capital gain capital loss for regular crypto tokens that's absolutely the the way that it goes it's just holding period cost basis and your sale proceeds and you can get short-term or long-term capital gains treatment on that For NFTs, the IRS hasn't issued any specific guidance for NFTs, but the general consensus is that, if not most NFTs, a lot of NFTs are taxed as collectibles. So even if you hold it for over a year and you'd normally get long-term capital gains, you're going to be paying 28% versus the 20% that you would with a regular capital gain. Yeah, I want to go into some of the NFT specifics in a second, but a couple other questions I had about just regular crypto or tokens. Is it also impacted by the wash sell rule? So that if, you know, if you sell for a loss, can you rebuy immediately or do you have to wait a specific amount of time before you're able to rebuy that specific token? Right now, it's not subject to the wash sale rules, which is a huge advantage for crypto at this point in time. There have been several proposals over the past couple of years trying to close that loophole, but they haven't gotten a a whole lot of traction yet. I think it's inevitable that they're going to close the loophole at some point, but at this moment in time, you don't have to deal with the wash sale rules. So that's a huge advantage versus what you guys do with actual securities in the market where you've got to look at where you think the market's going to be in 31 days or try to put options in there to hedge or whatever the mechanism that you have to use with crypto as it exists today it's pretty simple you've got something that has a huge unrealized loss on it you can sell it and immediately buy it back but at that point you've realized the loss and then can use it to offset against other capital gains you have or just carry it forward to future years yeah and then a crypto loss that can offset a gain from any other type of asset correct or is it specifically crypto loss against crypto loss No, it can offset against your regular, everything goes into different buckets, but that goes into the regular Schedule D capital gains and losses, the same as trading stocks would be. So if you've got a huge loss in crypto and a bunch of gains in your trading the stock market, those two do offset against each other. And speaking about the Schedule D and and tax returns, I know like if someone has a, let's say a regular brokerage account where they have that Apple, Google stock, at the end of the year, they're going to get a nice 1099 from the custodian. It's showed any income, any capital gains beautifully buttoned up every piece of information you possibly need how what's the equivalent are these wallets or call them custodians on the crypto side keeping track of everything properly are they sending out 1099s or is the onus on the investor or the or the crypto holder to do everything themselves it's largely on the investor it's slowly getting better over time as the sec and irs and different agencies are trying to wrap their arms around this a little bit better None of the crypto exchanges will issue you a formal 1099, or I I should say, I think like Robinhood Crypto and a few of these other ones that function a little bit differently since they're under a traditional securities firm, they'll send you a 1099, but most of them won't. But the centralized exchanges like Coinbase is probably the best example because they're publicly traded. The IRS has forced those centralized exchanges to keep track of the stuff that's happening on exchange. So at the very least, they're keeping track of the sales proceeds and the cost basis of the stuff that you bought on that platform. The problem becomes is if you're on one of these decentralized exchanges, or if you're even just on 
10 different centralized exchanges and you're transferring the money back and forth, nobody is keeping track of the holding period, cost basis, any of that. So if you're just trading on one exchange like Coinbase, they'll give you a report that will give you the majority of the information you need to file your tax return. But if you've got any sort of advanced activity at all, if you're in the DeFi space, you're not getting any of that. So it's on you to keep track of that, which which is a nightmare right now, regardless of, of how, how you cut it. Because either you're trying to manually do it on a spreadsheet, which is next to impossible, or you use a specialized software like Cointracker, Coinly. There, there's some some software programs that are specifically designed to try to aggregate all that data and give you a report. And they do a pretty good job, but it's like they get you 90% of the way there. You still end up having to make manual adjustments yourself because it, it, it inevitably doesn't fully and properly capture the reality of the transactions. Yeah. So we, we've talked a lot about the transactions and whether there's capital gain, capital loss, reporting it. But what about income? I know there's some platforms out there where you can lend your crypto or even stake in crypto and income is generated. How is that treated you know, with respect to taxes? Right now, they're issuing... It's not exactly interest or dividend income because it goes on a different portion of the return, but it's generally just taxed as income upon receipt. So if you're getting that on a Coinbase or one of these platforms that is already required to do more reporting for you, they're either going to issue you a 1099 INT for interest or a 1099 miscellaneous for whatever deposit rewards or staking income that you, you received from that. So that's pretty straightforward where it gets complicated again is if you're doing it on DeFi and you've got it on these self custody wallets or protocols that's not done through a centralized exchange and if you have a ton of crypto which would then be generating a ton of staking income or deposit rewards the other thing you can run into is again that volatility can foul you up because it's taxable upon receipt and at the value the token was as of the date you received it so if you're getting a couple thousand dollars of staking rewards, who cares? It's not going to make a huge difference. But if you're in one of these protocols that gives sort of ridiculously high interest rates and the market isn't tanking, you know, that can add up quicker than people will realize. Sure. Is crypto, is there a concept of like a like kind, like a 1031 exchange similar to, to real estate? No, unfortunately, there's not. And there, there's two reasons for that. One is that when they passed the Tax Cuts and Job Act in 2017, this was after crypto had had its first like real mainstream boom. And I think they anticipated that people were going to want to try to, to take that route and that theory. And they amended it, the tax code, to very specifically say that 1031 exchanges can only be done for tangible assets. Intangible assets are completely off the, the table on that. There was a question that came up, and this is more a point of curiosity because it's 2017 and before, but people asked, okay, so that's after this point in time. What about before the tax code was amended? Could we do it for 2017 and prior? And the IRS, several years later, issued guidance saying no because it's similar to the way that they'll treat gold and precious metals. Like you can't swap gold and silver and do it as a 1031 exchange because they say the use case and the utility is different. That's what they, they examined Ethereum, Litecoin and Bitcoin and they broke down why people hold them, what their value is, what the use proposition is. And they said, even prior to 2017, we're not going to allow you to do this just because we think that they're different enough that they're not like kind. So on both counts, you, you, got, you get hosed on that. Okay. One thing that I've always wondered about crypto and taxes is like so, sometimes you'll hear, hear people say that, yes, this is going to be a real currency and you'll be able to walk into Starbucks and buy a coffee with crypto. Is that actually going to be a taxable transaction since technically you're selling crypto to buy whatever good or service you're trying to buy? Right now, unfortunately, yes, that, that's the way it is because in which – to, to what you're getting at, that creates this logistical nightmare. Right. Because crypto, for all the utility blockchain has, so far crypto has failed pretty badly at being an actual currency. Because the processing times are largely too too long. It's hard to, on, to buy the crypto from a fiat currency anyway. 
So what they're doing and where you're getting a lot more traction as crypto being used as a currency is on these crypto debit and credit cards. So for the debit cards, where you're, it's basically a prepaid debit card where you're just loading your crypto on there and every time you swipe, you're spending it. Right now, it doesn't matter if that's a $1 transaction that you're swiping, that is a taxable event you have to report. There's been a couple people in Congress who proposed legislation. It's called something along the lines of the Virtual Currency Fairness Act or something similar to that where they have, they've proposed that if the transaction is under $200, it's exempt from the reporting requirements and it being a taxable gain or loss. Which if they do that, that's going to be a huge advantage and keep and save people a lot of hassle. I always say they're going to have to tweak it a little bit just because they're going to have to look at the aggregate number of sales you have in a certain period because otherwise you're going to have people who are selling $2 million of Bitcoin but each transaction is $199. So I think that's going to get fixed here in the next couple years, but right now you've got to deal with it. So one of the things we'll advise people to do is two options. One is get a crypto credit card. There's, there's a handful. I think there's two out there now, one with Gemini and one with maybe BlockFi. Credit cards are a little bit different because you're not actually spending your crypto. You're just accruing a liability, and then they're just paying you in crypto rewards instead of giving you cash back or points. So a crypto credit card avoids that. The other option is to load your debit card with a stable coin, which at least then those stable coins stay at a dollar. So even though you've got to report the proceeds, you're not going to have a taxable gain then. Yeah. So I know that the world of crypto in general, it's evolving very rapidly. And I'm sure we keep hearing about regulations or regulatory changes that are about to happen. What do you see coming or next? I know you mentioned one that's possibly in Congress, but what else do you see coming on the tax side of crypto coming down the pipeline? A tremendous amount of lawsuits. <laughs> because the, the IRS so far has issued guidance on a very a very scant number of things. They've done it on that you can't do 1031 exchanges. Coin for coin trades are taxable, like we discussed. They've said that your crypto wallets are not considered foreign bank accounts for FBAR filing, although I think they're going to eventually try to impose that as well. They've said that hard forks and airdrops are taxable income, and they've said that mining income is taxed as business income. But that's it. So when it comes to staking rewards, which we've got a pretty good idea of how that's going to be taxed, but they still haven't issued explicit guidance on it. So staking rewards, NFTs, nodes, all of these things that are just, as the space is rapidly, rapidly evolving, they haven't issued any real guidance on the majority of it. And there's not much legislation coming out of Congress at this point. So given how rapidly the, the, the lack of guidance, the legislation and guidance that's coming out not being super friendly to crypto investors, and just how quickly the space is evolving, we think for all of these things, since they're really complex, nuanced issues, that for most of them there's going to be a lot of litigation that comes out with people either challenging the established IRS position or trying to force the IRS to give a, a stated position through litigation. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what comes. What happens in the event that, whether it's an NFT or a token, becomes worthless? Is it just like a straight capital loss? Can you deduct it? Yeah, you, you can. There's, there's some steps you have to take to do it, and this is the same as traditional securities. If you have something that becomes worthless, you have to permanently dispose of, of the asset because even if it becomes worthless until you have relinquished all ownership and potential benefits from it, they don't let you write it off. So the way that we'll typically do this is you when you're sending crypto, you're usually sending it to a, a different wallet or with its own wallet address. Usually what you'll do is you send your worthless crypto to a dead wallet that you don't have any access to. So that way it gets it out of your wallet and there's no way for you to retrieve it, which shows you've permanently disposed of it. What about in the event of, of fraud? You hear all these stories about you know wallets getting hacked. Is that similar or the same as a worthless crypto or is that treated any differently when it comes to taxes you can just do it as a worthless crypto you can also do it as the same as any other like a, a casualty or theft loss that that's the other option you'd have which sometimes that 
provides a significant advantage, sometimes it ends up being the same as if you took the capital loss. So you've got a couple different options depending on how much you lost and just the particulars of your situation. It could make sense to do it with the casual loss way. could make sense just to show it with all your other transactions. And does it matter at all if at the time of the, the hack or the fraud, let's say I bought the crypto for 10000 and at the time it was worth 20000 Is that any different than if it was worth 5000 No, unfortunately, you're stuck with whatever your cost basis was. And that's, that's frustrating on a couple different, different counts because you, you had all this income that then got s- stolen from you. And we're seeing this with the, some of these centralized exchanges like Celsius and Voyager both went bankrupt. First, withdrawals got suspended. Now they're going bankrupt. So you could have people who deposited all their crypto tokens on there for, you know, they, they bought Bitcoin at $2,000 and then got locked out of their account when Bitcoin turned $50,000, you're still only able to write off the cost basis, even though the fact that the exchange went and solved it and froze you out, there's some significant opportunity cost there. But unfortunately, there's no mechanism to, to account for that on the tax return. You touched briefly on it uh, previously, but what about NFTs? Are they treated any differently um, in terms of taxes than crypto tokens are? Yeah, so, so NFTs, again, the caveat we have to say with all these things is the IRS hasn't issued any specific guidance. So we're, what we have to do in these cases is find something that's reasonably analogous with an established tax law or investing or real estate or whatever that seems the most analogous to what we're, the way the crypto project works. So for most NFTs, they're kind of what you'd call the, the profile picture NFTs, where it's the board apes, the crypto punks, these things that they don't provide actual utility, you're just buying them for the collectability aspect and bragging rights or whatever. Those we feel pretty confident that those are taxed as collectibles, which is pretty much the same as regular capital gains and losses, except it's a maximum of 28% versus the maximum of 20 with traditional securities and other assets. But NFTs, and we think this is going to be probably one of the most litigated parts of crypto coming up, NFTs can represent this huge, this wide array of different things and the use cases behind them. And I'll I'll usually give a couple examples of this. One is that there are some NFTs that basically are granting you membership to a Discord server or a Telegram group or some kind of mastermind where you're buying the NFT, but that's just your price of entry. And a lot of times those have it to where I'm in one Discord group where the NFT, it expires at the end of 2022. After 2022, I no longer have access to that group. So even though I'm theoretically buying an intangible asset, the useful life of that is is very limited. So I, I'm really buying a subscription. That should be at least taxed differently than the thing that I'm buying to hold and hoping it appreciates in value. And within NFTs, you also have metaverse NFTs or a, a lot of um, play-to-earn gaming is a big space w- within crypto where... You play a game and you earn a little bit of crypto tokens for playing the game instead of buy, getting you know, in-game gold that's not on the blockchain. So those rewards, you're actually getting some amount of money for playing the game. And a lot of those games are NFT-based, where the items you're buying in the game are NFTs. The example we'll go to is, let's say you're buying some game that's like a, a World of Warcraft imitation. And you buy a piece of land, In the game, you buy a building to run a a tavern out of, you buy a hammer that every time you swing it, it degrades in durability and eventually just goes away entirely, you buy a weapon, you buy a piece of art that you hang in your house in the game. Well, if those were the real world equivalents, they'd all be taxed very differently. The land wouldn't depreciate at all. The building would depreciate over 40 years. Some of the items you would just flat out expense. So... I think what the IRS is going to do initially is they're going to say either these just sit on your books, you're not allowed to amortize them or expense them at all until you dispose of them, or maybe they'll let you amortize them over like 15 years or something. And I think 
people are going to either get audited, and that's what the IRS tries to impose on them, or sue the IRS outright saying, yeah, I know it's an NFT, I know it's an intangible asset, but look at how it's actually being used. Look at how differently it is being used versus these collectible NFTs. So right now, there's no clear answer, but I think, I think there's going to be a lot of controversy and just a lot of conflict over that with these two kind of opposing viewpoints of, of how they should be taxed and expensed. Yeah. Um, with where crypto is now compared to where it previously was and where maybe it will go in the future, are there any strategies that someone can do, whether maybe they have inherent gains or inherent losses in their crypto or NFTs to really set themselves up for maybe, you know, going forward and, and there is another run in this space? Absolutely. There's, um, it, it really depends on how you're investing, the scope of your invest. It, it, it depends on the particulars of, of your situation, but there's a few things that one will recommend for almost anybody. One is that since crypto is not subject to the wash sale rules and the fact that we're in this real bear market within crypto, especially right now, we say if you've got unrealized losses, and they're of consequence, not if you've got a $100 unrealized loss, but if you've got anything significant at all, it absolutely makes sense to go ahead and realize those losses. Either it offsets against the gains you have this year or, or it carries forward. The only downside is going to be whatever the exchange, the fees of processing those transactions. But again, if it's, if it's a big loss, that absolutely makes sense. The other thing that we'll talk about a little bit, and this doesn't work out for, for everybody, but in certain types of crypto income, depending on what you're doing, you might have some level of control as to when the taxable events are generated and when, when that income tax will hit you. And normally, especially in a bull market, we're just trying to push that off as much as we possibly can. When you're, when you're already making a bunch, bunch of money, you're in a higher income tax bracket. You're, we, don't, we don't want more income than we need. But if you're in a really low income year, it can make sense in certain instances to actually accelerate your income, take the hit now, and then there can be some pretty significant tax savings down the road when you do ultimately either realize, realize those gains or have more income coming in. The other thing that we'll talk about, and this is really basic, but I can't tell you how many people don't do it, is just cashing out a poor, as you're having realized income, be it staking rewards, trading income, mining income, whatever, as you're getting these realized taxable events that hit, make sure you're cashing out a portion of that into a fiat currency and setting us out for taxes. Because we've had some people come to us who made a million dollars the previous year in crypto projects, but just kept reinvesting into the projects. And then the project didn't completely tank, but it went down greater than 90%. So we've had people who've come to us who would have had like $500,000 tax bills, but their portfolio is only worth a hundred or $200,000 now. Versus if whenever they had the, the, were making those transactions in real time, they said, all right, we're going to cash out 40% of this and it's going into my savings account. And I'm just going to completely forget about it. Their portfolio would still be down a good bit, but they wouldn't have to be liquidating their portfolio at really low prices just to try to pay the tax bill. Yeah. Can crypto be bought inside an IRA or a Roth and just avoid having to deal with any of this? Or if it can be done, does that bring on some other problems? There's a handful of companies that will do it where you can set up an IRA or a Roth IRA. I think those are the only accounts that allow for it right now. I've heard sort of, and I could be wrong on this, there, there have been whispers about some like solar 401ks maybe instituting that and probably some of the self-employed plans down the road will allow for it. But I think at this moment in time, it's just Roth and traditional IRAs that allow for it. And it has to be done through a special custodian and company, at least from what we've seen, your regular financial advisor is not going to be able to do that for you. Right. Well, it just about wraps up today's episode. Micah, I'd like to thank you for being on the show today. You brought some great insight into the world of cryptocurrency and taxes. How best can someone reach out to you and find out more about what you do? Yeah, so if they're crypto investors, the best place to go is going to be CryptoTaxCPA.com. If they're just a regular business or a more traditional setup, they can go to FrameCPA.com. That's our main site. And 
if they're having questions on crypto tax but aren't at the point when they need to hire us yet, we do have the book you mentioned at the outset, Decrypting Crypto Taxes. That's free on Amazon right now, so you can get the digital download of that, no cost. And we tried to set that up where every chapter is basically a frequently asked question we've got in. So if they go to the table of contents, hopefully the issue they're running into, we've, we've got some guidance on. Awesome. We'll link to all that in the show notes. Thanks again, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Thank you for listening to the Agent of Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Boutis Financial. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial planning and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investments and financial planning.